Hi folks, welcome back to Recently Seen Reading. I'm Heather and I thought I would do a fairly brief, I think, um, non-fiction November wrap-up as the storm that's going to engulf us for the next three days is just getting underway here. So I made good progress in non-fiction November, although I didn't get through everything I had hoped to read. Normally I read about 30% of my reading is non-fiction. And in November, I managed to do about 50% of my reading, so about 10 books. I get through about 20 in an average month, so I'm happy with that. One I haven't talked about before is Lewis Hyde's most recent book, which is called A Primer for Forgetting. So Lewis Hyde has written a, a several um, well-written, semi-scholarly well-informed discussions of various topics. He tends to work thematically, so the one I've read most recently is, is The Gift, which is one of his earliest books, and it talks about how gifts function in the, in the community and in the, in the economy. And I found it quite a useful thing to have read in the past to help me think about how, um, how economies work, how um, capitalist economies work, how academic economies work, how indigenous economies work quite an interesting book, so I, that led me to pick up A Primer for Forgetting. And it's a different kind of beast than his other books. It, it's um, similarly scholarly, but written for an audience um, with a little bit of patience, but it doesn't come with the same kind of chapter structure that's traditional in a, a popular history or scholarly history intended for, for a general audience. Um, or, or a crossover audience is probably a better way of describing it. It's written in a series of fragments. The fragments are, are clustered together in four chapters. And they, are, they all deal with um, what it means to forget, what it means to remember, how forgetting is connected or not connected to concepts of forgiveness and justice or injustice. And I thought it was quite an interesting book to read. I went through it the first time and then I had to return it to the library, so it's on my list of books to get in the new year, hopefully in February, to reread. It's a, an interesting departure from his usual structure of, of very well-crafted full chapters. And I think that structure that he's chosen is tied in part to the topic, what it means to forget, what it means to remember. And when I reread it, what I'm going to be looking for it in part is how it all holds together, how the fragments all are all held together, and how his thoughts about his mother, who was struggling with dementia at the time he was writing part of the book, um, how she figures in, in it. It's a book I'd recommend, especially if you've read Hyde's earlier books. The other one I read, um, and I've talked about it before, was After Daybreak by Ben Shepard, which is about the liberation of Belson. I've talked about that previously, so I won't go into it anymore. This one gave me a little bit of a reading hangover as you'd expect. So I didn't get to the second book on Belson that I was interested in reading that. I will tackle probably in December or January. So in addition to those two books, The Hyde and The Shepherd, I also read A Clutch of Memoirs. So I've spoken already about Saeed Jones' How We Fight for Our Lives, which I'd recommend. It's a good, good memoir and I've since read his collection of poetry he wrote before that and I'm about to reread that later this week. Some of the poetry is incredibly beautiful, and it covers the same kinds of ground. Um, not identical ground, but similar kinds of um, topics and issues and concerns as his memoir does. The other one I finished in memoir as a part of nonfiction November reading was something called Rebent Sinner by Ivan Coyote. And this is a collection of short thoughts, short essays, performance pieces from Coyote, who's a BC storyteller, performer, and writer. If you've seen Coyote perform, and I've seen them perform twice now, I think, you'll be able to hear the voice coming through very clearly in all of the pieces. Much of, of Coyote's work is dealing with um, how gender is presented in the world, how, how bullying is endemic in our culture. Coyote makes a fair amount of their living, I think, by presenting in high schools about um, bullying essentially and what to do if you are being bullied. That work is very taxing I think, emotionally taxing because it, it puts Coyote always in the position of being the, 
the person to explain themselves. So you can hear in, in, in these, this collection of essays just the accumulation of um, fatigue, I think. And that's a good thing as someone to see in a collection because I think it, people who come from what we conventionally call marginalized communities carry the burden of educated people who, who belong to or fit in more dominant communities and it's exhausting. Um, so I very much appreciated that note that runs through, through Rebent Center. The other thing that, that's interesting in this memoir is Coyote's mourning, essentially mourning for a lost generation of LBGTQ elders. Um, Coyote's younger than I am, um, but has memories of the men, and some women, but primarily the men who didn't survive the AIDS epidemic in the 80s and 90s. It's a touching thing to, to read, to think about what it's like to, to move through the world where you're on a stage explaining your community to, to high schoolers, primarily, and to know that most of, or many of your, of your elders, the people you would look up to, are not available to you um, for just con consoling conversations because they're dead. It makes it an interesting collection to read. It's not a difficult collection to read. Um, it has a very light hand in describing the difficulties of a life lived um, in a trans body and a very clear voice, lots of little short pieces, um, which is pretty typical for Coyote's writing. The other memoir I finished um, is kind of at the opposite end of the age spectrum from these two, Diane Attill's Alive Alive O. Now, Attill died last year at the age of 101, I believe. And so she was born in 1917, and I love her work. I love the, pr the perspective of um, a very old woman um, thinking and talking about, out loud about her life. Atil, in this collection and in, in her other memoirs, most of which she wrote after she turned 70, she just explodes any kind of stereotype you might have about what it was like to be a young woman in the 1920s and 1930s. Any kind of stereotype you might have about sexual repression, emotional repression, political conservatism and she's very valuable to read for that account. She had a long happy life with multiple partners, male partners, and lived for a long time with uh, Barry Reckford who was married to another woman but had a long relationship with Atil, lived in her home, they lived together and then at one point his, his um, secondary or tertiary female partner moved in to the household as well. So Atil was living um, at a time when we think this wasn't done um, in a, a open marriage or a polyamorous marriage or partnership. And her writing is, is beautiful. Um, she worked as an editor for a long time, so it's very rare to find anything extraneous in her prose. And it's very frank. Um, frank, and but not maudlin. It's frank about her sexual history, frank about um, the fact that she had a couple of abortions in her youth, there's a, a devastating chapter in this of, of um, a pregnancy she lost when she was in her early 40s, a pregnancy she wanted to keep, and she had a, a catastrophic miscarriage that nearly killed her. But she's very frank about uh, about the, that reality for women in the in the 1940s and 1950s, the, that um, women who weren't particularly conventional had full lives, and those lives were full of um, all kinds of complexities and happinesses. There's also excellent kind of chapters in Alive Alive O about what it meant to be a woman in her 90s and making the decision to move out of your home and into essentially what is a, a nursing home or an assisted living facility. But I find those uh, accounts quite compelling. I mean, she's so clear-eyed. If you're looking for a short memoir uh, from a perspective that's very very different from the memoirs of much younger people like Saeed Jones. I'd recommend that Hill wholeheartedly. What else did I read for nonfiction of ever? Ah, my polar reading. So I got about a quarter of the way through Robert Scott's journals and I'm enjoying them, noticing, as I mentioned before, things I didn't notice when I read it 10-15 years ago, but I haven't finished it yet. I also picked up um, Aston's memoir of skiing across Antarctica, and I'm about a, oh, a quarter of the way from the end of it. Now it's a very different beast than Scott's account, and I'm 
we'll talk more about that in a wrap up. It's very much like other kinds of um, Antarctica accounts of adventuring across the plateau and very different in other ways. Not as successful as some other accounts. The other half of my nonfiction November reading was taken up by reading and library history. I'm working on a, a research project about the development of a certain type of library. So I've read a fair amount of primary sources from the 1930s and 40s that I'm not going to talk about. If you're curious about them, let me know and I'll, I can chat about them. Or one of those rare creatures out there who is interested in library history or the theory of libraries, you might want to pick up Sam Popovich's recently published, let me get this right, Confronting the Democratic Discourse of Librarianship. Popovich is very interested in taking apart the idea that libraries are neutral institutions and very interested in looking at this idea of, of what intellectual freedom means and how libraries are or are not entangled in that concept. It's a stalwart Marxist reading of libraries, essentially. I have mixed feelings and thoughts about it. I think I would recommend it for someone who is interested in, in political accounts of what libraries mean or might mean, but it, it's very theory heavy, so it has lots of engagement with leftist thinkers, so lots of working through what Marx had to say, and Eagleton, Frederick Jameson, Gramsci, and so on, and not so much about the actual physical history of how libraries of various sorts were built in North America. Um, and I think that's probably it's actually its, its biggest weakness, it's not the Marxist theory and apparatus, but, but the, that very theoretical approach, which is the primary goal of the book, um, keeps Popovich quite a ways away from, from interrogating actual lived history. And in some cases, that actual lived history would support the claim he's making. Um, so it's a book really for people who are kind of mm, deeply into library stuff. So a good nonfiction November for me, even though I didn't finish everything I wanted to finish. And I'm happy with that. I hope you've had a fabulous November. And if you're in the path of this sloppy, messy storm that's moving up the East Coast, I hope you've got a good pair of waterproof boots and some soup. It's going to be a messy three or four days. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.